Welcome to Open Your Reality, ladies and gentlemen. Today we have a guest that we had on the show about a month or two ago. His name is Professor Brinson, and he, I found him to be extremely interesting and enlightening. He talks a lot about the astral world, near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences, and he has a unique spin on it. And that's why I brought him on. Now, the last time I had you on, Professor Brinson, you gave some very interesting responses to my questions. And there were some viewers that really love your style and they really resonated with your message. And there were other viewers who were very critical of it. And so in this video, I'm going to be talking more about the critical comments and questions. I like that. I like that rather than all of the uh, applause from some of the other viewers. So, Professor, um, you told me even before the interview that you're, you also, you, you enjoy your critics. Why is that? Okay. Have you ever read Chaucer Canterbury Tales A long in English? time ago. A long okay. time ago. Let me just refresh your mind. Mm -hmm. Chaucer, who wrote the book, uh, as he was on his way to Canterbury, he became a character along with the other poets. And when he gave the worst, everybody recited different poetic songs or made certain statements with their eloquence. And when he said, said something in poetry, it was the worst rhyme he could give. The critics got after him. <laughs> Sometimes when a person is spiritually or has some spiritual experience, they can learn to love their critics. In, in Christianity, Christ said, love your enemies. Mm -hmm. Christ came in and he was crucified. So your critics can improve your consciousness. They think they can. They may not know your level of experience, so you let them criticize you and you can learn from their statements. And then maybe I can help them understand me better because we all are the same. We all made of consciousness. Right. Right. And that's what a lot of, of the new age says, like, like the law of one. We are all one, but we're divided into different consciousnesses. But at heart, we're all one. So yes. Professor Brinson, I want to start off uh, going through this list of questions that I have. Uh, because there were a few people, maybe more than a few people in the last video that said that you weren't clear, that you rambled a little bit, that you were a bit scattered in your ideas, and they wanted you to be a little bit more focused at, on the questions that I asked. Okay. So this is, this is not a question, but somebody said the professor has a huge ego. How would, okay. I know, I know I'm starting right off with the detractor. I like what you're saying. <laughs> So how, how, would, how would you respond to that? Okay. Let me go back to the creator now. The creator is one, right? And the creator created all species, including human beings, right? And he created the illusion that they have ego, right? Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> some people have small egos and humble, and some have big egos. But when you meet an advanced spiritual human being, he can act like he got a small uh, ego. But actually, that being is connected with the highest source, which is the super ego. God got the biggest ego. He encompasses all of us. So as you make spiritual progress, you can learn to be a good actor. You can act humble. <laughs> but actually, when you're the only being with all of the power, you can act Haughty and everything else because everything is a drama, an act to him. And people can get caught up in the act of the actor that's acting. So we all are actors in this world. Like Shakespeare says, the whole world is a stage and we all actors, but we don't know we're acting. So as you make spiritual progress, you discover in order to win the highest. Well, let me just say this, not to ramble. In this world, you can act. And you could win an Emmy. In this world, you can act and you can win a Grammy. In this world, the highest acting is considered an Academy Award. The creator has different levels of acting. And the highest acting he 
wants to give us as secret is a spiritual academy award. Only the great actors, Christ acted like he was suffering on the cross. He was not suffering if he's God. You can't kill God. He was acting. I can go into it if they ask a question about why he was acting. But let me not go into that unless they ask a question. Let me be specific. So if I'm acting with ego, they can ex maybe I made a mistake. Maybe I should not be acting. But most of the people, are, I assure you, enjoyed it. And they didn't look at that part. You can look from your perspective and think a person is acting with ego. And that's your perspective. That's your way of seeing things. But that person, like there have been some spiritually advanced people who acted with so much ego. Christ came in and turned over the tables and what are y'all doing? That was ego. And Kabir, these mystics have been killed. Christ was not the only one crucified. People thought he was a king. He was not a king in this world. You're, not, you're gonna have a mixture of perfection and imperfection in this world. We live in a world of both. But the mystics, the advanced people are extremely perfect, but we don't know what perfect is because we're looking with imperfect eyes. Yeah, so, I, I, I don't think it's necessarily bad if you have a big ego. Many of no. the actors and entertainers and sports stars, the biggest yes. ones, have egos. And I think people equate having an ego with being selfish. But you can have an ego and you could be a big personality and you could still be a very giving person and be a yes. philanthropist. So e we all have egos. We all have to do what's best for us. That's how it is in this world. We, we have to have ego. We have to feel we separate. We're not separate. And if we can cross separateness, then we'll discover that everybody's the same. The more you can approach crossing that stage of separation, the more you will learn to express your real self, which is love which is a unificational process. Yes. When, when I was younger, I grew up in the early, mid 1970s, late seventies. Uh, there was a lot of separatism, especially where I grew up in New York. All the black people live here. The white people live here. The Jewish people live here. The Italian people live here. The Irish people here. So, you know, no, of course we all mixed, but most people were segregated. And so I grew up thinking that people that were different from me were different. And then I traveled around the world and I've been to Asia three times, Europe three times. And from what I've learned, having relationships, sometimes intimate relationships with people from all over is that, you know, we're really all the same. Um, and so when it comes to down to the heart, uh, down to the, the heart, the being level, we really all experience the same emotions. We feel the same ways, generally speaking. So you know, it's just a, a fear of, of different customs, different language. They feel alien to us. But if you really knew them, you would see that they're just like you. And so I do believe that we are one, but we are also separate here in this reality. Yeah, right. For sure. Uh, there's a, there's something, somebody else quoted uh, that... This is not a question, but maybe something that you can you can expand on. Hello, Professor Brinson. Uh, Professor Brinson is onto something here because when I meditated with a sacrament with my spiritual teacher, I heard beautiful bells sound that I've never heard before. I never mentioned them to my spiritual teacher. However, thanks to Professor Brinson, I now know. And I believe you said that when you're meditating, sometimes you can hear these type of beautiful noises, or even during near-death experiences or astral travel. Can you comment a bit on that, please? Yes. I'm going to show this book, Embraced by the Light, Betty Eady. She's a friend of mine. She was on Oprah Winfrey show. And in her near-death experience, I believe she was in the hospital. She was a Catholic, Orthodox, and she had a near-death experience. Actually, she got out of the body, which, which classifies OBE or near death. But she, and she went into the heavens. The first thing she experienced was some bell sound. They were beautifully chiming sounds. Very attractive. She made a spiritual, I won't call it a spiritual mistake. She made a worldly mistake of, putting up, of being attracted toward that sound. 
and that sound snatched her, pulled her out of the body and rapidly took her to the heavens. And she ended up in the elementary school of the spiritual world, which is the astral plane. That's where all of the heavens and hells exist. She didn't know that was the elementary school. She didn't know other planes exist. This is the matrix of the first spiritual world. So when she got there, she enjoyed herself. Now that sound could change as you go higher up. That sound is the vibratory energy of the creator. It's creating all these matrices and levels of consciousness. And that sound, if you put your attention on it, she heard, if she had, she'd never heard the trumpet sound. The trumpet sound is the second sound which can pull you to the causal plane. But you have to be taught by somebody of these different sounds. There are different sounds that can pull you to the beyond the causal, to the salvation stage. But you still haven't gone back to the Lord. You know who yourself will be when you get there at the salvation stage. I went to that stage with my teacher and I wanted to go all the way back. He said, no, it's not your time. At the right stage, when you physically leave this body for real, you'll go back to the highest stage. So he said, you got to go back to earth and do some work. So that sound, when it flows from the highest stage, it has different sound. It's like water flowing off a Niagara fall, it hits the ground and makes a loud sound. As it flows over uh, rocks, it makes a different sound. As it flows over grass, it makes a different sound. Cement, different sound. So the sound is actually one. But your attention will think it's different depending on the stages that you're being pulled to. Make sense? Makes sense. And also there was another viewer who said that he accidentally went to the astral world one time and he could still remember every detail. And the one thing that intrigued him to this day is the constant whispering that he heard. He says, the best way I could describe it was a woman whispering fast in what I can best describe as some sort of Asian dialect. Didn't understand a word being said, but it was calming nonetheless, just wanted to share. Is that okay. something common if we go to the astral world, we might hear something like that? Okay. You don't have to go to the astral world. If a person just tonight closed his or her eyes, sit up straight, so they don't fall asleep and just try to listen intense, intensely with your attention, not with your ears now, with the attention, because the attention is your real self inside this body. And you start hearing a strange humming sound. Sometimes you can hear a sound like static going through an electric wire, or if you turn your TV on and it's not on the right station, It'll go buzz, buzz, buzz. You can hear a sound like that. And that sound, as it improves itself in your concentration, it turns into a bell. Now, some people who practice meditation in a previous life, they can hear some type of chanting. The chanting purpose is to reduce the worldly thoughts going through your mind. Some people practice om, om kar, you know, some kind of sound. That sound normally is a mantra that they're given, and that word has no meaning in this world. Because all of the words we use got meanings, and the meanings take us into a thought pattern, which is a matrix. And the matrix got meaning. So you're trying to shut down meaning and go back to the, your real self, where everything exists. So when a person is practicing a mantra yoga, they're trying to shut down thoughts and get in touch with the sound. So they may be picking up some mantra that they picked up from a previous life, but it's a unique thing. The main thing is to get in touch with the sound. Like in John, in the Bible, uh, third chapter, eight verse, Christ is talking to Nicodemus. But it's in all spiritual literature, they talk about this. But since most People I talk to are Christian. Sometimes I talk to Muslim. But in the Christian literature in the Bible, John 3, verse 8 through 12, Christ tells Nicodemus, who, by the way, became a vegetarian after he met Christ. He tells Nicodemus, when you 
you got to be born again. Nicodemus said, how can I be born again? Can I enter my mother's womb a second time? He said, no, I'm not talking that way. He laughed. Marvel. I said, you have to be born again. You have to. You only can be. Those who are born again hear this strange sound like a wind. You cannot tell from whence it come or whether it goes. It's inside your head. It'll take you to the astral plane and you'll be born again. But that wind sound will turn into a bell. He didn't talk about the bell at that time. Because he know the wind sound is easy to hear if you just be quiet. Okay. Yeah, I, there's another viewer, uh, and we'll get to the whole vegetarian thing later on, but uh, okay. there's some questions on that. But uh, there's another viewer who said, a lot of what Professor Brinson said was fascinating. I wish he explained his astral traveling better because I'm assuming he's done it several times, not just during his NDE, but maybe I misunderstood. So how many times have you astral traveled? Can you do it at will? And do you still astral travel? When I first got on the spiritual path with my teacher, he could do it at will. And I practiced. I used to hear these different sounds. And one time I heard a sound that scared the hell out of me because you don't really want to die. Nobody wants to die, not even a bird, not even a dog. We're made to be survivors. It's in the DNA. So when I had the experience, I felt like I couldn't breathe. I was about to choke. I got scared. And I wrote him a letter. He said, why are you scared? I'm going to greet you when you die. So you have to overcome that fear, that initial fear. So I started practicing. I overcame it. And then I didn't get it again. I used to get it quite a bit. And I went to him and we talked. He became a business partner with me. We were laughing and joking. He said, look, if you get too much of that sound at will, you don't want to be here. You want to stay in the higher world. You're going to want deeper parts of that. So you got some karma to go through. You got some destiny to go through. You got to do things here. So you got to live here for so long. And so I understood that. So when I died clinically at Rush Hospital, he took me to the third stage. I didn't want to come back. He said, now, you see what I said? You had a problem. You never went this far before. You only went to the astral. And you enjoyed it. You used to have frequent experiences. And you didn't know that when you woke up, which is dying in the physical body, dying is a process of awakening up to the astral plane. When you wake up to that astral plane, your age will come back if you go far enough in the astral world. You will discover that you have a life of thousands of years. The average lifespan there is three, four, five thousand 5,000 years of age. In the physical world, the average lifespan of a male is 70 some years, 76, I think, and the woman a little longer, maybe 78. That is your identity. That is where your ego comes from. Oh, you wake up in the morning from a dream. You don't have to open up your eyes. You don't have to pinch yourself. Immediately, you know, I'm 16, 17, 30, 40, 50. That comes back to you, which is the identity. I'm going to college. I got kids. I got a wife. I'm this old. You know, I've been in the hospital. All this knowledge come back to you of this world. Same thing happens when you get into the astral plane, if you go far enough. So therefore, you know, you are awake at that stage. I like to use that word awake and fully when you wake up from the astral plane. Some people are partially awake and they don't have full knowledge of what I'm saying. They've never had a full wakeful experience of having a memory of thousands of years coming back to them. Um, I'm I'm curious, when you said your teacher told you that information, was it in the astral world or was it in Earth? He told me on Earth, but I didn't want to believe it because I'm in a matrix. <laughs> you mm -hmm. can try to believe it and say you believe it, but he wants you to have experiential awareness, not intellectual awareness. He gave me intellectual awareness of the teaching. But what, what we're looking for, everybody's looking for spiritual awareness or spiritual experiences where they themselves can validate the evidence. They don't need a teacher at that stage, but you can understand and appreciate the teacher if he's there with you. You say, oh, wow, he told me the truth. Now I got knowledge like he got at that level. Does that make sense? It does. Uh, you use the word matrix, and I know that there are a number of people on my channel that believe in the whole soul trap okay. theory, so to speak. Yes. Okay, good. 
And you mentioned Soul Trap. Do you believe, I mean, you mentioned Matrix, but do you believe that the Matrix is a Soul Trap? Or do you think that there is an all loving, encompassing God and it's just, we're just calling it a, a Soul Trap because we don't like the experience here? Okay, I'll explain it from both perspectives. In the movie Matrix, which I enjoyed and saw several times, mm -hmm. uh, Fishburne, Lawrence Fishburne, was trying to work with Keanu Reeves, who was Neo in the movie. Okay, yeah, and Fishburne was Morpheus. Yes, Morpheus. <laughs> and so it's a good movie because uh, Neo thought it was real. They had a conversation at a point in there, and Neo said, "I have a feeling that I'm a." in a dream, but I can't verify it, okay? Sometimes when you're approaching wakefulness, you can feel you dreaming, but you don't know where your body is, right? <laughs> if you ever had that experience where you're almost about to wake. And so Neil was talking like that. That's a highly spiritual movie, okay? I don't know who wrote it, but they must have had some experience to write it. But anyway, when uh, Neo discovered at the end of the movie uh, or near the end, that he had gone into another state where machines and aliens, he had gone to another level. And so Morpheus' whole role, symbolically, his whole role was to get uh, Neo out of the dream. And that's how real spirituality operates. So my teacher had a teacher who got him out of this trap. I can call it a trap now. Because you got three bodies. You got three traps. Each body is a trap. Physical body is a trap because it keeps our awareness localized in the physical material world. We don't know that the other worlds exist. We think this is real. Then you got an emotional or an astral trap which traps us at the next stage where all of the heavens, everything exists. You can call it a matrix. Then we have another trap of the mental world, causal world. That's the last trap before you get self-realization. So these are traps or these are matrices. If you call them matrices, I'm using the word matrix as a thought pattern. We create thoughts. The soul doesn't need thoughts. The thoughts, the soul automatically got knowledge. It doesn't have total knowledge. It has a form of knowledge almost as similar to the knowledge of God. But his willpower is limited while it's in the soul region or in the mental world, the astral and the causal. Every time it goes down, it diminishes his knowledge for a reason. God has done that because he's one. God, everything he's created, the devil, all of this, he, he's one. But he wants to have entertainment. Entertainment plays a role too. <laughs> Why do we enjoy entertainment? We do the same thing here. We get bored. Let me go to a movie. Let me see a copper. Let me uh, go play some basketball. We're looking for entertainment. We're doing the same thing because we are a miniaturized expression or a miniaturized version of God. We have the same qualities. And as we go back, we discover that the entertainment becomes greater and greater. We start enjoying this play or this drama. Like Shakespeare says, the whole world is an act. And when you become the Spiritual Academy Award winner, then you can come back and play with souls that you've created. You create the illusion of souls in your dream world. You create beautiful women. You create houses. You create food. You, you have the feeling of driving a car. You wake up, oh, man, I don't have a car. You create the feeling that you're rich. That was a, a my, my teacher told me that was a friend of his in India. He had a large family. And he had 12 children, and he didn't make that much money. And his wife would argue with him all the time when he come home. And he read in the newspaper where he could go and practice a type of dream yoga, where he could learn to dream about whatever he wanted to when he went to sleep. So he would come home, give us some money, and get into bed. And he did this for years. And one day, they got into an argument. She said, why do you sleep all the time? He said, I'm going to tell you something you may not like. She said, I'm listening. He said, first get the anger out of you. And so she smiled. He cracked a joke. She said, I'm ready for it. 
He said, I met someone a decade and a half ago who taught me how to dream about whatever I wanted to dream about it and how to do it in a lucid way. And I could create airplanes and fly them. I could create beautiful people that I could meet with, including beautiful women. She said, what? She said, well, this is not real. Now, don't get jealous. I never created no women in the dream world. I mean, in that real physical world, I'm loyal to you. But she said, well, go on. You better not. <laughs> That's when he got into a small argument. And he said, I ate food. I enjoyed myself. I created rocket ships. I went out in space and traveled to different planets. I met different beings there. All kinds of species. I enjoyed myself. And so that's why I went to sleep. That was like turning on television to me. Because when I woke up, you would argue with me. I knew I, I couldn't make enough money to feed all these 12 kids. So that was his experience. He was explaining something that we trying to do and go back to our real self. As we go back, there are different levels of entertainment, different levels of knowledge, different levels of joy. Once you get into the upper part of the astral plane, there are no evil people. Everybody's enjoyable. The animals don't fight with each other. There's no violence. You can think and create houses in the sky. You can think and make yourself look pretty. You do that here when you think. Let me go see a plastic surgeon when I get old. Let me put on some cream on my face so I look younger. Thinking is a big process, which comes from the mind. And the mind is the biggest trap, the biggest matrix that we have to overcome. Mm. There's a lot that you said there, a lot that you said uh, that I would want to comment on, but I think I forgot most of my thoughts, unfortunately. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I could say this. Okay. I relate to this story of the guy who learned uh, – dream yoga because for me when i go to sleep i'm very entertained because i interact with beings i go places i do things and my mind sets it all up it's really incredible it's not like it's, I'm, it, I'm not it's even not. thinking about when i go to sleep i'm just thinking of uh, maybe something i have to do tomorrow or what i did today and then bam i'm in this dream when i'm interacting with people it's incredible man is a machine a movie machine and it makes you think things are real when you wake up, you discover where are these people? Where did they go? You don't know where they went. But if you know and understand intellectually, consciousness is one. That the creator is one. All the religions of the world, all the founders said that God is one. He doesn't have anybody else. So if you understand that intellectually, you can relax yourself and say, wow, how do I re you reunite with the greatest being that exists? I can entertain myself and do whatever I want. I can create. I got all kinds of powers. That's what you do when you go to sleep, depending on how deep you go into that consciousness of yourself. Well, what would you say about hallucinations? Because okay. um, I, I recently talked with someone who had an hallucination. I won't mention who that person is. But this person has maybe never had uh, a really strong hallucination in their life. Maybe, maybe once or twice, something small. But this one was huge. Uh, and, and this person explained to me all the details of the hallucination. It did not sound like a dream at all. Um, and, and, the, and the difference was it seemed completely real. And, and uh, what is the difference between a dream and hallucination? Is it the same thing or is there a difference? Okay, I'm going to give you two perspectives. You ever heard of Timothy Leary? Yes. Harvard University who experimented with mushrooms. Mm -hmm. And my teacher went to that school at that time. And because he was start describing an experience of himself with his teacher. And they said, what mushrooms are you using? And he said, you should not use mushrooms because mushroom can make you lose the control of what you're experiencing. Um, and you can see things that are not in this world, but are being projected from the astral projection in this world. And they can be horrific or pleasurable experiences. And sometimes people, when they take these drugs and mushrooms and different types of uh, psychedelic pills, they can start seeing things and jump out of a window and thinking they've seen a swimming pool. <laughs> That's the danger. So I don't know the details of the experience that your friend, he said it was huge. 
Was it pleasant or horrible? Well, that's the thing. It was part of it was sort of pleasant, and the other part was not. So this person, it was it happened at night, and they were sleeping on on a a, a king size bed, and all these little figures and men were running around on the bed, and it and this person said that it squeezed them to the point where they were in this. They were like all on the side of the bed, and and it, they were running through the room, and it kept them awake all night. And uh, it, I mean, it seemed very detailed. I was, uh, and 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 this person was sure that these things actually existed. Okay, you remember in the Matrix when Fishburne and his assistants who were surrounding uh, Neo, they put something in his stomach. And he created all these bugs and things, and he started having a horrible experience he was feeling. He was feeling it because he thought they were real. He was mm-hmm. feeling it with his astral body. He was feeling it. And you can do that in the dream world. You can have sex, which is a pleasurable experience. You can feel it's real in the dream world. You can see a beautiful woman. You wake up and you got an ugly wife. You say, what the hell have I got? You understand? That's how the experience takes place. Everybody wants to have a sustained experience in their wakeful state. And you can get it. Get you a good job. Get you to man. You know, you create a good family. And then and be intelligent and don't get into drugs. And try to read and understand. Because intellect is mental thinking. It can create all our problems. But your intellect should be used to ask questions. Ask questions, go to bookstores, read, meet people, ask them questions, and they should be able to satisfy you. This is what my teacher told me. He said, if you ask questions, and if he cannot satisfy you by giving you the right answer, then he has failed in his duty. Because his duty is to give you the answer which is in your head, it's in his head, it's in everybody's head. And if you pay attention and don't get the answer, keep asking questions until you get the answer. And I did that. And I was fully satisfied intellectually. And I got the experiential awareness, too, to verify the intellect. I have another question here about the astral world from a viewer. And I'll read it. It's a little bit long. It says, how can you have now this in the last um, interview we did? You said that you can have physical things in the astral world, like like you talked about building a house or, or things like that. Um, so this person asks, how can you have jobs, science, and computers in the astral world when you don't have a material body there? You only have that kind of stuff on Earth to overcome the massive limitations and issues with the body. Without the need to eat and without the limitations of communication, you don't need that stuff. That's kind of contradictory, like much of the stuff he's saying. Okay. So, how, how would you answer that question, Professor? Okay. First, I would ask that person if I had an opportunity to say, have you actually been to the astral world? If they just talking from intellect, then I'll try to give an answer. If they're talking from experience, it'll be easy to give the answer. But I'll try to simplify it as though they've never been there. If they've been there, they'll understand it. If they've not been there, then I'm making it simple. Uh, whenever you have a dream experience, you have a body. You normally don't look at it. <laughs> If you can remember that you're dreaming while you're dreaming, take a look at your body. You see if you're black or if you've got uh, a a lighter skin color. You may be Indian. You may be Asian. You may be Chinese because everybody dreams. And sometimes they normally dream in the body in which they're in, in the physical body. But sometimes they can dream near a bird, an animal. I had an experience talking to a person three decades ago who was from Nigeria. He was in one of my classes and he asked me a question. He said, Professor, I had a strange dream. I said, okay, share it. He said, I want to share it to you privately. I said, okay, when everybody else leaves, you can share it. So when he left, he said, sir, don't think that I'm crazy. I had a dream. It was extremely lucid. And I dreamed I was an eagle. Now, my job was to see if he was just playing. So I tried to create doubt in him. I said, how you know you were an eagle? He said, sir, I was flying. I saw my beak in front of my nose, and I saw my wings. I said, what color were your wings? He said, they were brown. I said, what else happened? So I was convinced when he said he was dreaming because he got so much emotional passion in it. He said, I saw a rat in the field, and I was hungry. 
And I grabbed him and picked him up and ate it. And when I woke up, I said, how can I eat a rat? <laughs> I said, you didn't eat one. I said, did it taste good? He said, yes, while I was in the dream. I said, but you actually didn't eat it. <laughs> You're looking at it from this perspective now. He understood it. I said, tell me some more dream. He said, I had two more. He said, I had another dream where there was an African lady in Africa. I said, you know. He said, because we dress a certain way, and I saw her dress a certain way. Tell me more about her. She had a, a rake, and she had a broom, and she was in a field, and there was a fence. And I said, what did you do? He said, I was moving on four legs. I said, what? I said, did you see your legs? He said, yeah, I saw my, it wasn't fingernails. It was like, like a dog. Uh, I probably was a, uh, some kind of animal. It was not a large animal. And I was hungry. I said, you were hungry? What did you want? He said, I wanted to get some of her chickens, which were running around. So I said, you may have been a fox or something. And he said, uh, the lady saw me and she said some words and tried to shake a broom and a thing and I ran. I said, that was a real experience. But when you woke up, you knew you were not a fox or some animal. He said, yes. Then he had one more experience. He said he was in a, still in Africa. He was, had got into a, a yard. Beautiful house, he could recall. He couldn't get in the house. He ran up the, the drain, got on the roof. There were other squirrels up there. That's how you know you were a squirrel. I was playing with them and I saw my legs. I was brown and we were having a good time. Squirrel language, we were making strange noise. And I then he said, I woke up. Now, when we have a dream, we think it's real. Now I said, now nah, it could, I said, most likely in your case, if it was that lucid, you used to be these animals before. That shocked him. He said, Why? I said, This body you in now is not you. It's a costume you wear you can wear any costume you can wear the costume of a bird or a fox or even of a fly consciousness can become anything and take on the life of that thing and the ego gets reduced according to the life that is taken on or it can grow like an elephant and become huge elephant you can't you're not gonna mess with an elephant Ego knows it can trample over you, right? And he said, that makes a lot of sense. So I hope I have simplified it to the extent whether the person have had an astral experience with awareness or was just thinking and reading. Because all of these worlds are nothing but a reflection of a reflection of a reflection. I think I said that uh, last time. Just like you have a dream inside of a dream inside of a dream, a matrix inside of a higher matrix, higher matrix until you go all the way back to the original way in which you created all of these matrix. But you lose your awareness of yourself as you come down and down and down. And you take on different bodies, which you tend to think is yourself. It's not yourself. It's a covering that you wear. It's a trap that's restricting and inhibiting your awareness, depending on what level you're operating from. But is it meant to be a trap out of nefarious means from the creator, or is that just the way it is, and we pro we project our own thoughts onto it as a matrix? Oh, that's a very difficult question. Let me see if I can think about it and simplify it. Okay. Let's say we choose. We have the illusion of choice. Because before you get to the causal plane, you don't have any karma. Karma is in the causal plane. I think I talked about that. All of the karma of everybody, every species, everything is in the upper part of the causal plane. When you get there, you'll discover a feeling of oneness that you can be a dog, a car, car, anything, animal. You got all of these things in you, all of the life forms. You can have the experience of oneness in the causal plane. 
in the astral plane, you can have when I said the causal plane, you can have the experience of everything at one time, of being one with everything. In the astral plane, it's segmented to some extent. You can have the feeling of being one with a flower. Like in the book I showed you, Betty Edie, there's a page in which she went into a garden in this book. That's her picture. You may want to get this book. Uh, she went into a garden and she loved flowers on earth. So she went into the heavens and she saw a flower. And she had a thought. I wonder how it feels to be a flower. And immediately she became that flower. She was feeling she was actually the flower. And she was dancing and moving to the sound of the music that existed in that region. And she said it was a strange, wonderful feeling. Because she always wanted to. She loved flowers. So that was a segment and separated experience. The astral plane, everything you can feel oneness with. In this world, you can have a feeling of oneness. You can play on the Bulls, Michael Jordan. Oh, we're going to beat uh, the Pacers. We're going to beat the Warriors. You know what I mean? They are fighting against another team, but they feel one with that team. So when you're on a team, you can feel one. That's a reflection of a lower expression. As you get to a higher astral world, you can feel actually one. When you get to the causal world, you can feel total oneness, which is... I called at that time, I don't know if I said it on your program, that that was a counterfeit God. <laughs> the causal plane is nothing but a machine, and it's a counter, it acts like a counterfeit God. It's not the real God. The real God is much further up. You have to cross the causal plane or the causal matrix and to get to know your real self, and that's where you are really experiencing salvation. You don't have to reincarnate anymore, but you still have not gone back. In order to go back, you must meet a human being who has gone. You must meet a human being in the physical form who has come to this world, taught you. He's not teaching you. He's trying to teach you. He just using teaching for the, for the mind. He wants you to get rid of the mind and have faith. And in faith, there is trust. And in trust, there is love. And when you love him after he loves you first, you start trusting and you drop the mind and intellect. And you become like a baby. And as a baby, once you get to the, the salvation stage, cross the mind, he wraps you in his or her soul and flies you back to your original home. And you become one with that being. You become actually God at that point. That may be strange for people who have not studied this. Any other question? Oh, I have a lot of questions. Sorry. Yeah. If you hear noise in the background, doing con I live in a, in a building that they have like uh, construction going on here and there. So, well, get exhausted until I satisfy all your exhaustion. Otherwise, we have another session. Okay. Well, I would, I would welcome another session, but I have some questions. I was curious going back to the animals. Do you think every animal has its own unique personality and also dreams as well? Can you answer that quickly, please? DNA is what create the personality. You can say DNA is God in a sense at this level. All people have different personality. Now, I'll tell you something about personality. They've been able to measure it in this world. Scientists have done research. What they do, they hook up electrodes to people that they've done study with. And these electrodes create certain wavelengths and they come up with a theory which they verified that all human beings have a certain vibrational pattern and that's the personality <laughs> you see just like you look a certain way even twins got different personalities they similar you find german shepherd they similar but they can be different in terms of personality you got pit bulls, they can be different. Some pit bulls, if you treat them a certain way, they won't go and kill another animal. They just, they got to be taught how to do that. Most of them have the instinct to kill anyway. They can kill a newborn baby if the baby mess with it. So we all have different personalities. Animals, everything got different personalities.
because all of them are consciousness. Different personalities are necessary in the world of separation. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, I've had dogs and cats throughout my lifetime, and each one, I had four cats at one point. They all had their own separate, distinct, unique personalities. So I think it's pretty cool. And I know animals dream. I could see my cats, you know, they're moving in their <laughs> sleep. And I always thought that was so cute. <laughs> Let me comment on that. Sure. I don't want to be going off on a tangent. That was a philosopher. He was a Chinese philosopher. And he had a teacher. And he said he had a dream that was so lucid. It was really not a dream, the teacher told him. He dreamed he was a butterfly. He had so much knowledge and so much beauty, beautiful as a butterfly. More knowledge than human beings have. And then when he woke up, he said, what was this? Am I a butterfly or a human being? He said, you could have been a butterfly dreaming you were a human being. <laughs> so the dog can be dreaming that they got a different form. Plats also can become human. Did you know that? I don't know if I said that before. No, I don't think you mentioned that. You want me to talk about it or not to go off on a tangent? You can go up a little bit. Of, you're saying that a plant can become a human being? Yes. A plant has life in it. There was a famous doctor. Uh, if you can pull him up on YouTube or your audience may want to put him up on YouTube. Are you talking about Clive Baxter? Yes. He had plants hooked up to electrodes. And they made certain wave patterns. And he recorded those patterns, as you recall. Your audience may not know about this, but when he recorded them, the vibrational pattern that was expressed through uh, on a paper, when they, if he would cut himself, the plant would pick up on the pain that that species experienced. The plant, the plant could tell even if the person was lying to some extent. So the plant is like a lie detector. That's how I like to tell a lot of things are made off vibratory energy, ex wave patterns, but they can't use them in court. So if you tell a person that a plant has a soul or can become human, everything that the creator has created, he's put his consciousness into it. He would never tell you to eat something dead. He was to eat life and you're meant to eat plant life because you don't pick up too much karma when you eat plant life. They're the lowest form of life. They got all of the medicine, all of the health ingredients, but the plants only eat sun and water. We, they're the only species who can eat the sun. We can't eat the sun. We can only eat the second best source of food, which is plants. Don't go to the third and try to eat animals and all of this. Eat the second best source. It'll give you a longer lifespan. It won't clog your arteries up because plants have no cholesterol. All animals got cholesterol. Yeah, so I, I wanted to also say, so just just to uh, just just to clarify, this Clive Baxter did an experiment in the 1960s where he hooked up plants to polygraph, and the yes. polygraph because David Wilcock talks about it in his books, but when when the, a person went to the plant with a a lighter, like it was going to light it on fire, the polygraph started going crazy. <laughs> plant didn't want to die. How did the plant know? Right, it didn't have eyes to see it but I'm sure that it felt it. And plants actually communicate with each other. Yes. They, they let out fragrances and they also <laughs> communicate with, they have a symbiotic relationship with ants and other um, insects. Yes. So they'll allow um, an ants, for example, to maybe eat their sap and, and walk on their bark. If they <laughs> destroy, if they destroy other predators that would do a lot more harm to them. So, <laughs> It's everything is communicating with each other. That's why people like the movie Avatar so much, Avatar 1 and 2, because it shows this whole natural world where everything is in flux and communicating with each other. And that's really the way it is. And um, we should live in harmony with everything. So that's why I said, don't eat animals. Try to harmonize with them. You learn from your cats, but you don't want nobody killing your cats. In China, they actually eat cats. They, I know that, yeah. You know that. Yes, and in, well, in Thailand they eat bugs too, and I'm not, I'm not <laughs> one for eating bugs. Believe me, I would never. But 
there's a there's a question here, and I think we should get to it because it's kind of important. It it has to do with karma and free will. Um, someone says, really enjoyed the talk, but a glaring inconsistency appeared as you tried to press Professor Brinson on the free will issue. The professor states the law of karma is the most powerful force in the realm, greater than gravity. Perhaps he's right, but karma cannot exist if we have no free will. Karma is the idea that we get rewarded for good deeds and punished for bad deeds, right? But if yes. I'm not able to choose, how can there be a reward or punishment? It's also a low-level way to act in the world. Taking 100% accountability is higher consciousness, and that's not opinion. So this person is saying, I believe you said that we really don't have free will. And if we really don't have free will, how can we be punished for the deeds of uh, good or bad deeds that we do because we're not really making the choice. Okay. You actually, when you were with your total self back in your original place of origin, there was no karma. As you came down, you separated yourself from that total self and that's when you created the soul. You still don't have any karma. But when you got into the mind, You picked up karma for the sake of having functional experience in the mental region, in the astral region, and in the, uh, the so-called physical region. And you can only have these experiences in these three traps by having a feeling of illusionary free, I mean, of having no free will. When you get to the physical world, you have the illusion of free will. I can do what I want to do. This man, Prince, got this strange hat on. This black fellow is crazy. He doesn't know what he's talking about. <clears throat> you can say all kinds of things. Your free will can make you think you can say those things. You can even say, I can go kill the president. I can go show people. But if your free will is superficially expressed, you won't do them. If it's intensified, concentratedly expressed, that's when you do it. But who creates the intensity? Your karma. The Lord is the only being in creation that's really got free will. And if we're not real, that's the thing you got to learn. You are him. Everybody is God. They're not the ego. They're not the, the body. The body, these bodies are just trapped. So you suspend your free will like you do to a movie. You go to a movie. You pretend that everything that you don't know is taking place. You start acting, oh man, let's root for the good. Let's root for the evil. You know, but you suspended. You suspended your free will once you got into the realm of the mind. Okay? So you do it for the sake of enjoying the drama or the movie. This is a movie we in. This is a matrix. We enjoy horror movies. I'm sure everybody have watched horror movies, especially around Halloween. But they know they go to Halloween parties and scare each other. Oh, you know, but they know when they in that Halloween costume on Earth, they know it's not real. But when they take off the Halloween party, somebody comes, stick them up, want to shoot them. They think it's real because they think they're going to die. But if they have gone to the astral plane and high up, they'll say, go ahead and shoot me. man. <laughs> you can't kill me. They get that crazy. They know they can't die yet. So that's how we have these experiences of what we call free will in this body. We really don't have it. We wrote the script, which came from our higher self, and we created a strange experience of the illusion of free will. The illusion of free will is real in order to go back. There's only two beings in creation that have the, uh, free will. Human beings have illusionary free will out of ignorance. The creator got free will out of knowledge. Okay? But he likes us because he comes and get us. He doesn't get the rest of the beings because they don't have free will. Like the angels, they got to become human beings to have the illusion of free will. He only pick up human beings because they are made in his image. When I say image, it's the way you exercise your will. Angels cannot exercise their will. No higher beings up to the causal. Because they know exactly what's going to happen. They have no free will. It's only in the human body 
that you have no free will, but you have the illusion of it. And your real is so real, you can't get rid of it. It's so real that even if the creator came down here and told you, oh, you crazy, man. You can't kill me. You can kill him. He, you know, he, he submit to his creation. He maintains the illusion of free will, even though he may be God. Most of these great mystics, whether Kabir, Shama Tabriz, you never heard of these people. Dadu, Mansur, they were considered highly developed spiritual mystics. Next time I'll talk about mystic. Highly developed. Christ? Why would Christ get crucified? In three days rise up. He knew it was going to happen. He was not an ordinary human being, but one of his best disciples who was human said to Christ when the Roman soldiers came to crucify him, Christ, he whispered to Christ, and Christ whispered back and said, look, Peter, I know you said you'll die for me. Don't mess with these soldiers. Don't hurt them. Don't cut them with your sword. But Peter, you BSing yourself. You'll deny me three times before the cock crows. <laughs> but I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven in spite of that. And so when Peter the soldiers came to kill Christ and they were looking for his, all of his soldiers. They wanted to kill everybody because they thought that Jesus was a king in this world. Pontius Pilate brought Christ to the kingdom, his kingdom, and tortured him and say, deny that you not come here to overthrow the world. He said, no. He said, they say you're a king. Is that true? He said, yes. But my kingdom is not of this world. And they said, he's a lunatic. Go ahead and do what y'all want with it. So they could not understand at that time spiritual dimension, spiritual world. Even the disciples had a hard time. But Christ said, before I leave, I'm going to make you the successor. You'll have the keys, which means you learn how to unlock that door behind the eyes, the pineal gland, and go into the astral plane and hurry off and meet me, and I'll take you further. So I hope I've answered that question. If I not ask it again in a different way. Yeah, well, I think you did answer it pretty thoroughly. Uh, we have uh, several more questions left, so if we can get through them quickly, then we okay. can conclude the interview. But uh, this goes a little bit back to karma and what you were talking about with diet. So uh, here's the comment. According to this man's ideas, meaning you, Professor Brinson, you have a lot of karma to pay off for the fact of your diet being all meat. Me, meaning referring to me, not that my diet is all meat anymore, but I do eat meat. Um, Professor Brinson must be a vegetarian. In my opinion, he really doesn't know what he is talking about. When we eat meat, that animal has already been slaughtered. You have no karma on you for that. If that were the case, then the lion and tigers have the largest accumulated karma for eating meat. How do you respond to that? Very simple question. <laughs> Very simple. It's only, you can only create karma when you exercise thinking and will. Animals operate on instinct. <laughs> Their instincts, they don't think, they just automatically kill because they get hungry. And they need anger in order to kill. If they satisfied, they just go back to sleep, they won't bother you. But when they get hungry, they start hunting. And they're predators, that's what predators do. Uh, when we're human, if so, another human being kill an animal and feed us with our mother or anybody or in a restaurant, we think we don't create karma. But the human cells in the body appears to be more intelligent than us. It's not more intelligent, it appears. Like if you get sick, the liver stores all of the medicine. And if you cut your finger, say your pinky finger, this little finger, the small one, the cells immediately will pick up the medicine because it also stores all of the medicine and hormones in the liver. And it takes that medicine and go to the left hand and the pinky finger. It doesn't go to the right hand. That's how intelligent the liver is. It communicates with the rest of the cells and say, so go put some medicine and you have a scab going over the cut if it's not a large cut. Okay? That's how the body expresses its intelligence. So, when we eat an animal, the mind picks up. The subconscious mind picks up. 
Oh, this is me. Therefore, it picks up some of the karma. <laughs> you can't trick this body. You can trick yourself, but not this body. But if you kill it, you pick up more. So you pick up a shared karma with the slaughterhouse, with the everybody that's involved in that process of killing and packaging that out. That's how it works. Any other question? <laughs> No, no. I mean, um, I, I don't want to get into um, a long debate about all that, but I, I slightly disagree because I do feel that we as human beings for the 200,000 years or so that we've been here, we've su survived mostly by eating meat. So I think we do have a kind of a base animal instinct in a sense to survive and eating meat is part of survival. But I get I won't, I won't disagree with you because, you know, we've been here for millions of years. We've not gotten out. So the only way to get out, you have to pay attention. You, if you want to disagree with me, disagree on this instant. You, you have a Christian background. You probably study other religions too, right? Uh, I don't have a Christian background, but I have studied religions. Okay. All of the religions founders go way back in the time. Bhagavad Gita, uh, Mahabharata, Quran, uh, Zena Vista, uh, they all had said in their books that they come here to pick up their disciples, the seekers. But their the seekers have been seeking for hundreds of years, looking for their real self. And so when they come up, they only pick up a few. And they teach them this. And they try to tell you to get rid of the animal nature because in America, in the world, 55 billion animals are being killed every year. 55 billion. And it's only about seven and a half billion people on earth. And we feed a lot of people unnecessarily. You don't want your cats or animals killed. Your compassion is there. But you said, well, I'm not killing. But you have compassion for other animals, right? You don't want to kill a cow, do you? No, I don't want any animals to die at all. You don't want them to die for your sake, do you? No. All human beings don't want to see an animal die. They automatically will put on brakes. I don't mean to shout, but if an animal runs in front of the car without thinking, they put on brakes because they're a nonviolent species. It's built into their DNA. The nonviolent animals always sweat through the skin. Horses, cows, and sheep, that's the way they sweat. We also sweat through the skin. The violent, killing animals, the predator animal, predatorial, they sweat through the tongue. All of them do they got the instrument on the body in which to kill. They don't need to get brick sticks and gone. They don't need to hire people. We go out and unintentionally hire people to kill these animals, wrap them up in cellophane. We cook them. We say, well, we didn't create no common. So therefore, our body has adjusted. Your body can adjust to anything, but it can destroy you eventually. And you can suffer from different diseases. These animals have the same consciousness that you got. You said your uh, cats or whatever you got, they have a personality. That's consciousness. They can feel pain. So law of karma, regardless of how you think, if you create pain, you have to receive the pain. That's why it's so rigid. It doesn't care about your thinking. I said more rigid than gravity. As we become more conscious, we become more alert. If you have any children and they're newborn and you're on a high rise, and they walk out to the roof of the house if you leave the window open or the veranda. And they said, Daddy, Daddy, you like school experience more fear. You or them, if they're only a few months old, crawling. Well, you will. Because you know gravity don't give a damn. They'll fall, brush their head, get fractured. You will fear because you know gravity doesn't care. Even if you pray, God, God, they, gravity doesn't care about things like that. So that's how we operate. We don't understand. I'm trying to give you understanding that you're not made like this. You got to go by, even if you forget everything I'm saying, forget, don't forget genetically how you made, like the horses and cows and the sheep. They will never eat meat. And there in London, a few years ago, they used to grind up meat from restaurants and feed the cow meat. And what happened to those cows? What kind of disease did they develop? Mad cow disease? Yes. We become mad human beings too, eventually slowly. It doesn't happen right away, but it happens over a period of time. Yeah. Okay. I mean I, I could you I could re I could rebut that, but I don't I don't want to because I don't want to
you know, make it into like a vegan versus carnivore. I'm not talking about veganism. I'm saying rebut it at the time of death. When you go, if you have a high astral experience and ask those beings there, how you made to eat, they'll tell you if you go high enough and meet them, they'll tell you, ask them if you can remember. Yep. I mean, look, I, I used to be a vegan and a vegetarian, so I understand, you know, okay. the, the whole consciousness thing of for years and years, you know, for ethical reasons and for health reasons. But, okay. um, you know, there's last last couple of questions I wanted to ask is uh, how do you generally spend your day? Are you retired now? Do you work? What What do you typically do each day? I'm retired. Uh, I've spent time with my family, my children. Uh, and people are constantly asking me to speak since I've had the near-death experience. I can speak on many subjects, not near-death. And after going into the higher world, the knowledge gets infused, and I can hold on to most of it. Not all of it, because in this body I'm being restricted. But uh, uh, I don't know if I said to you last time when I was on your program, and I didn't know whether to thank you or get after you, but you're responsible for me coming back to this world. Because my teacher said I have to come back and speak to hundreds and thousands of people, if not millions. And I'm doing it now. I didn't really want to be here. So, I don't know whether to thank you, but I'm, I can't blame you because he said that's my destiny. Okay. Well, I'm glad you're out here speaking. You know, I have a unique voice. You have a unique voice in this space. And some uh, very interesting things to say because you have direct experience of the astral world. Um, I wanted to ask you one other question. When you were younger, did you play any sports and which sports did you play? Basketball? Yes. I could shoot three pointers like Stephen Curry's. <laughs> I used to practice that. And one thing being in Chicago, when the Bulls were playing mm -hmm. uh, and they had won two or three peak repeats, and the reporters gathered around Michael Jordan and they asked him a question. I think they have, they've written it in some kind of magazine. And they asked him, they said, Michael Jordan, how many points are you going to hit tonight against the Cincinnati, some team? And he said, I at least get uh, 30, 32. They said, how do you know? What if they put three men's on you? He laughed and said, my confidence is so strong that if they put Three minutes, I can pass it off, but the quarter lasts 12 minutes. So all I need to hit is, you know, four three-pointers or two three-pointers. That's easy for me. <laughs> they just give me a little room. I can either shoot a, I can dunk it, or I can shoot way out and make it. I even learned how to shoot with my eyes closed at the free throw. He said, I love basketball. And Bird, who played for the Indiana Pacers, he gave Jordan the highest compliment. He said, that's not a human being. That's God. That's what Jordan, that's what Bird said. He said, that's God on human playing basketball with us. That's not a human being. So all great athletes express a different higher consciousness that they practice in the astral plane and have come here and become great athletes. Okay? <laughs> yeah, very interesting. Yes, I was a basketball player too. Never... Uh... Never played like college basketball, played intramural street basketball, but I also, Professor, was very good with the three pointers. So beautiful. So you can understand this. Now, your audience, now, one thing about a three pointer, not to go off on a tangent, I'm just speaking to you. Your audience can close their ears at this point. When you're shooting, you, don't you get a feeling sometimes you know it's going to go in? Of course. That's confidence. Where's that confidence coming from? Comes the from next astral plane. Hmm. It's like you got blind confidence in this world. Muhammad Ali had confidence. He said, I'm going to knock this man out in the seven ring. And it happened. Prophets have confidence, but there's blind confidence. All confidence, if it's intense in this world, is normally blind. You almost know that you're going to hit it because you have hit it before in the astral plane. So therefore, the confidence come. Even the score is known in advance. But people don't know it until they actually win. The, sh the Chiefs didn't know they were going to win the, the National Football Championship. <laughs> it was a tie. People were betting. If they had known, the casinos would have gone broke, right? So if, if I had known, I would have bet a lot of money. But if you know it, you're not supposed to use your attention that way. Okay, even if you know it. <laughs>
Yep. Our, another our great interview professor. Can you tell people where they can find you? Yes. I dash S E E K seek dot org O R G. I repeat it. I dash seek dot org. And they can email me or if they want to go directly to me. P as in Paul. R as in Robert. O as in Orange. F as in Frank. B as in Boy. R as in Robert. I as in the alphabet I. N as in Nancy. S O N. Professor Brinson. But you P P R O F. So, pro, 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 so it's P R O F Brinson at what? Gmail.com. At gmail.com. There you go. I'll post the links below. So making it easier for you guys just to see it. Professor, thank you so much for coming on the show. Once again, maybe we can have another show in a couple of months. I'm sure we'll get a lot of comments and questions on this one. It's beautiful that they can go into questioning because that's the way they can get satisfied. And if they ask questions, you can tell your audience, have they had intellectual experiences of reading books and listening to YouTube and not had an out-of-body experience? And if they had out-of-body experience, how far did they go? Did they go at least to the memory of being a thousand years of age? Then they can understand. If they don't, then I, my challenge become greater in terms of explaining it. Yeah. Well, thank thank you. you. Thank you, Professor, for being on the show. It's been wonderful. All right. Namaste. Namaste.